Santa Cruz is a picturesque beach community with its downtown business district hugging the San Lorenzo River, running through the center of town. Visitors often marvel at the unspoiled beauty of this historic village in its dramatic natural setting between high coast Sierras and the Pacific Ocean. Santa Cruz is still the kind of place that you can get out and walk around in, moving to a slower pace of pedestrians and bicycles. Next slide. But its historic look is not there by happenstance, but by hard-fought, painstaking effort. It isn't just development pressures that make preserving Santa Cruz difficult, but nature itself. Just about every 20 years, Santa Cruz experiences some disaster, like a fire, flood, or earthquake, usually affecting the downtown basin more severely. Next slide. Mm. When the Spanish mission was established here in 1791, mm. it was first constructed beside the San Lorenzo River, near where the clock tower is. But only a few months later, the mission was wiped out by a flood. Oh. It was rebuilt and destroyed by a storm, then in 1793 was constructed on top of Mission Hill. Mm. Never again did the Spanish build on the river flats, which became their vegetable garden south of Mission Hill and orchard land north of Mission Hill. Mm. Next. In 1797, the Spanish settlers' town of Villa de Branciforte was established on the Eastern Bluff. But instead of providing a militia to defend the mission against foreign intrusion, mistreatment and neglect by Spanish authorities compelled Branciforteans to take charge of their own political affairs. To counter misrepresentation, they elected their own representatives around 1803 making Branciforte the birthplace of democracy in Spanish California. They were among the first to call for the closure of the mission system, the independence of California from Spain, and welcomed the first non-Spanish settlers. Next slide. Mexico ended the mission system in 1834, giving mission buildings to the town of Branciforte one of which became their unused county jail. When mostly American adventurers arrived in town, they were directed to reside around the abandoned mission to keep wild living frontiersmen away from the settled families uh, of Branciforte. Thus, while Branciforte remained the farming side of town for another century, Santa Cruz grew into a town with an early New England appearance. Next slide. The business center of town was the old Mission Plaza. Blacksmith and Methodist preacher Elihu Anthony arrived in Santa Cruz around Christmas 1848, then acquired inferior leftover land such as the sloping sides of Mission Hill Bluff and a strip of floodplain land overhanging the river. He created the first subdivision in town hoping to sell this land as an industrial park for businesses that needed water power to run their machinery. Next slide. Yet yeah, this was the time when news of the gold strike circulated that would soon become the California gold rush. Most local men caught gold fever and had an adventure in the gold country with varying degrees of success. Mm -hmm. It was observed that miners were using wooden picks and had very little fresh vegetables. Anthony used ship's bolts to create the first iron picks used in the mines, and another Santa Cruzan sold potatoes out of the old mission gardens for which miners were willing to pay up to a dollar each. Next slide. This booming market sent potato growers to agricultural areas like Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, Soquel, and Watsonville in the spud rush of 1851. Santa Cruz land was renting for up to $100 an acre on the San Lorenzo River Flats, and the harvest of 1852 made fortunes. 
A boom town of wood frame tent cabins arose along the main road of the, ma- of the river flats. People made a fortune in this booming market and reinvested in a second crop while building a luxury hotel on the flats. And indeed, the 1853 crop was even bigger, but that was the problem. Potatoes had saturated the market and were now worthless. Mm -hmm. So those tent cabins were shingled over, creating an instant downtown in a place never intended to be a commercial area. Mm. The San Lorenzo River used to run parallel with River Street, but frequently flooded, forcing the relocation of parts of the river to the east with road-topped levees built as Water Street, Bulkhead Street, and River Street Extension. Mm. Next slide. James Leslie built the town's first brick building facing the Mission Plaza, but wouldn't let the county use the second floor of the county courthouse. So Friedrich Heen built the brick flat iron building for the use of the courthouse. His foresight paid off as it moved the Civic Center to the flats and Mission Plaza lost its preeminence as the center of town. Next slide. The downtown experienced growing pains because Mrs. Williams wouldn't let people extend Main Street below Soquel Avenue through her orchard. So Are you merchant- the orchard? Maybe. Sit down. Yeah. I'll you to go get the bathroom stool. No, I'm fine. Here. Just move your chair up. Dave, can you, can you mute people? This is speaker. I have Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. yes. In 1866, the town was largely abandoned. Oh, where am I? Uh, Willow Street was named Pacific Avenue because most people arriving in town uh, in the lower plaza and wanted to know how to get to the ocean. Mm. In 1866, the town was incorporated and the Civic Center was moved to Cooper Street. The Chinese settlers created, uh, moved into the largely abandoned Front Street business area, which became a one-block Chinatown. The new Pacific Avenue businesses no longer had back doors for warehouse goods, so a series of linked basements were created that ran several blocks in downtown. Next slide. Santa Cruz was an industrial town of leather, lumber, and limestone, but shipping by sea was more expensive than by rail, yet Santa Cruz had trouble getting a rail link, so downtown merchants financed their own rail link through Watsonville to the Southern Pacific, which opened in 1876. It was followed by a mountain line linking Santa Cruz to San Jose in 1880, The train leaving Santa Cruz with goods returned with tourists, yet they were chiefly here to see the local redwoods, then head for the cultural destinations of Monterey. Santa Cruz had an ugly downtown of utilitarian buildings constructed by people who never intended to stay. Yet there was a need to get tourists to stop here, so it was a sign of civic pride to construct beautiful buildings in the downtown. One of them you see here the 1877 Santa Cruz Opera House, built as the first thing that one saw upon leaving the uptown station. Next slide. The 1870s were an economic depression, leaving Irish and Chinese workers at the bottom of the employment ladder competing for the same jobs. An anti-Chinese movement took hold in California including Santa Cruz, where the intimacy of the Chinese community with downtown led to conflicts. Some institutions created Chinese protection clubs in Chinatown, such as the Congregational Chinese Mission and the Chinese Freemasons Club. In 1894, 
A fire that started in a Chinese laundry wiped out Chinatown, burned most of the downtown's tri-corner block, bounded by Pacific Front and Cooper Streets, and gutted the courthouse. Next slide. Mrs. Harriet Blackburn relocated some of the Chinese onto her Neary Lagoon property near the railroad tracks, while shoeshiner George Birkenseer relocated much of the rest of the Chinese to his Riverside compound off Cooper and Front Streets. The new courthouse was a magnificent Richardsonian Romanesque style with a rough, quartered, uh, a rough quarried foundation conveying a sense of rustic elegance to this nature-oriented resort town. Next slide. To avoid future fires, the tri-corner block was largely rebuilt with handsome masonry construction. Downtown Santa Cruz was dubbed the Florence of the West to emphasize its Renaissance look and art scene. Then in 1906, the earthquake occurred, destroying San Francisco. In Santa Cruz, most of the wood frame buildings rode out the quake without damage, while rigid masonry uh, elements like chimneys and brick walls were the chief target of cracking or toppling. Next slide. The cement plant had just opened in Davenport and became a popular reconstruction medium in San Francisco and Santa Cruz. Both reinforced concrete and reinforced masonry were the preferred method of reconstruction. Likewise, where cornices had previously created a falling hazard, they were now replaced with lightweight pressed tin cornices, finials, and spires. Next slide. The center of the tourist industry was actually downtown Santa Cruz, but with the building of the 1904 boardwalk and the 1907 reconstruction, fancy hotels and Spanish Moorish architecture began to proliferate along the waterfront as a picturesque reflection of our Mediterranean climate. Next slide. To compete, the downtown St. George Hotel was remodeled as the St. George Mission Inn in 1922, and other downtown businesses followed suit, adapting Spanish style. In addition, the downtown erected exciting new Art Deco buildings, one of the last styles that included artistic and uh, artists as subcontractors. This was also prohibition, and the downtown's linked underground basements became ideal for rum running. Next slide. The onset of the Great Depression was not the hit to local tourism that we feared, as the Bay Area replaced long-distance tourism with tourism close to home, meaning the attractions of Santa Cruz County. Buildings like the Del Mar Theater were constructed as palaces for the people to give even poor customers a first-class experience for a few nickels. The convention industry boomed with at least 30 halls and club rooms available and the Civic Auditorium constructed in 1940. Conventions were important for year-round visitors as there were at least two to three conventions in town every weekend. Next slide. World War II was an unprecedented industrial effort amidst shortages and rationing, with no construction allowed that didn't serve the war effort. When the war ended, the backlog of building projects and housing shortages for returning servicemen created a nationwide boom for community planning. Santa Cruz was just glad to get back to work and revived its pre-war economy. Next slide. Then during Christmas 1955, the town got a Christmas present they didn't want. It was just a week of gentle rain, but soon the downtown had filled up like a bathtub. Next slide. It flooded the underground basements, filled some of them so full of soil they were never re-excavated. 
important records stored in the basement of the Cooper Street Courthouse were soaked for the first time and had to be dried out page by page. The downtown was flooded from Mission Hill to Beach Hill and inland to the steps of City Hall. Next slide. Santa Cruz had plans to build a flood control basin between Water Street and Soquel Avenue bridges, but the Army Corps of Engineers wouldn't fund a project unless it included continuous levees along the river. Their original plan was to make the San Lorenzo into a concrete drainage ditch, but they lacked the funding, so instead they stripped the river of its trees and built levees along the downtown area. In the process, they eliminated the floodplain so the river would be at its minimum legal width of 70 feet. This was to provide additional real estate for development, but instead of making the town safe from the next 100-year flood, it actually increased the town's flooding risk. A wide volume of water traveling down the river does not compress itself when it reaches a narrow portion, but overflows the banks. Next slide. As the levees went in, downtown began a redevelopment process of planning for the future. Consultants said Santa Cruz tourist industry was a rinky-dinky relic that couldn't provide the modern economy of other cities. Tourism should give way to industrial development, making Santa Cruz the Detroit of the West, with an industrial corridor up the coast to Davenport, surrounded by suburban sprawl. Next slide. A series of freeways should be run through town so traffic could more quickly reach the boardwalk and levee without seeing the town. Downtown should be entirely demolished except for maybe three landmarks, City Hall, the Octagon, and the main post office. Blank cinder block buildings and skyscrapers should create a new downtown eliminating mixed use buildings. Next slide. Blocks should be combined into super blocks to make room for massive parking lots. One example of this was the Albertsons Long's Shopping Center, now CVS and Trader Joe's. Being auto-oriented meant that it turned its windowless door ba uh, doorless backs on a once bustling pedestrian street, killing the pedestrian interaction with downtown businesses. Next slide. Chuck and Esther Abbott had come to Santa Cruz to retire in 1963, attracted by its natural beauty, Victorian elegance, and pedestrian lifestyle. They were shocked when they saw landmarks, uh, landmarks buildings being remodeled into blank-walled boxes without character. They felt the downtown landmarks had more value being restored, as this level of detail and craftsmanship could not easily be replicated on today's market. Businessmen agreed, saying that their tourist economy depended on people seeing Santa Cruz as a, a unique place worth going, rather than nothing different from what you could find in their own hometowns. Next slide. Chuck's vision was to turn the downtown into a national historic district, landscaped with a Victorian garden mall. Through gentle persuasion, Chuck gained the support of the majority of businessmen, and the mall was constructed in 1968. Its theme buildings were the 1886 McEwen Bianchi Grocery at the head of Pacific Avenue, the Octagon Building, reflected in the honeycomb planters along the streets, and the old county courthouse. Next slide. All three of these buildings at one time were intended to be demolished. The California Heritage Council petitioned Santa Cruz not to demolish the Octagon Building, so it was remodeled into a museum. Next slide. The county moved out of the 1895 Cooper Street Courthouse and 
plan to demolish it for a downtown parking lot. Max Walden discovered it and begged for the opportunity to buy it. The county sold it to him for $75,000, saving the county $20,000 in demolition costs. Max converted it into the landmark Cooper House, an attraction of shops, art, and restaurants that perfectly matched the counterculture, counterculture aesthetic of the times. Next slide. The McEwen Bianchi Building was put on the National Register of Historic Places, but the Golden West Savings Bank bought it and, as Mayor Muley recalled, demolished it while the city was in negotiations to restore it. Next slide. The downtown was called the Pacific Garden Mall for 20 years ending in 1989 when we celebrated that milestone in the ruins of the Loma Prieta earthquake. Once again, downtown Santa Cruz was transformed into a redevelopment area. I tried to get the Historic Preservation Commission to keep the National Historic District status, but at the time the majority were business people who thought by not supporting preservation the downtown would be quickly rebuilt. This didn't happen, and the lack of national district status meant buildings that could have been saved were not. I was the historian of record on a number of condemned buildings, and know this for a fact. I joined the Historic Preservation Commission at the invitation of Chairwoman Sarah Ray and author Sarah Holmes Boutel, who believed as I did. I designed the county's earthquake memorial monument that stands in front of the old Cooper House site. Next slide. The downtown should never have been placed where it is, and much of it is imperiled by climate change through rising sea levels and heavier storm runoff. But while it is there, this downtown's character has been fought for, analyzed, and carefully crafted to retain some of the best elements of a pedestrian-oriented setting, human scale, and artistic detail. What is passed down to the next generation is an experience of beauty, community, and nature. Thank you very much. And now we are open for questions or comments. Oh, thank you so much, Ross. That was very enlightening and uh, very enjoyable. Thank Great. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Bravo. That, that, that was very deeply moving. Mm -hmm. I totally appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Ross, what do you see for the future of Santa Cruz, downtown Santa Cruz? Um, it seems like there's going to be more high rises. Do you think that's going to be fought? Do you think that's going to go through? Just curious about your opinion. Well, I'm afraid to say the, uh, the state has taken over um, for local, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it Control? Taken away local approval of anything related to housing. Oh. We may be able to talk about how it's designed, but uh, for the most part, housing projects can be inserted in any place in any way. Mm. And until we have something that is more equitable and more uh, locally driven, we're kind of uh, doomed to have uh, over overproduction. Mm. What about uh, all this emphasis on tradition and statuary? How does that enter into our history? Well, it's interesting. I've, I've looked up the kinds of monuments we've had in the past, and I noticed that there was a, uh, uh, they used to brag about uh, clean water and would put up fountains, and we put up a drinking fountain in front of the uh, 1866 courthouse, which was a beautiful uh, Grecian woman uh, in bronze, 
pointing down to the uh, the water fountain area where people could take a drink. Uh, that was one that uh, I don't know when it disappeared. I, I've been kind of curious about it. Then there was uh, a man. What was his name? Uh, oh, I forgot. He used to uh, he used to design sets at one of the local um, vaudeville houses, and he became an artist on the boardwalk, and uh, is a well-known painter. And he uh, he designed a giant archway. Uh, that we could uh, walk under for, I think it was uh, California's birthday. Yes. And it had these beautiful scenes of uh, of California, and I always hoped or wished that that would uh, come back. That was an, a monument that was worth seeing. Uh, what else would you like to know on that? Well, I, you just mentioned something very interesting. What might have been the issue with the Grecian woman? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, she had diaphanous gowns and was yes. quite see-through, so from some angles she sort of looked uh, nude. Yes. But uh, I don't know uh, if it might have been destroyed in the fire. Ah, uh, yes. Because uh, when the tri-corner block was destroyed, it the fire jumped Cooper Street and destroyed the courthouse, and maybe uh, because it was in front of the courthouse, it got melted down or something. I see. Russ, Mary McGrenahan here. Um, hi, Mary. Hi. The All the articles in the paper talking about the high-rise developments on Front Street now for, for affordable housing, et cetera, um, and they're saying that the 428 Front Street and 415 Front, I believe it was, um, are of historic value and they need to keep some of that architecture. I believe those were one-story buildings. Um, yes. I, you know, I remember that as a kid. That was uh, Chinatown and the old Garibaldi Hotel. And now I can't, I mean, I know I'm old, but to consider a building that was built in my lifetime as historic value is baffling to me when they took the wrecking ball to the Cooper House so instantly, yeah. instead of trying to save it. Mm -hmm. And that building could have been saved. I believe so, yeah. They had, uh gone through two years. Uh, that's why nobody was in the building. They had gone through two years of steel reinforcing all the exterior walls. And the only thing that uh, caused damage to the Cooper house was they had illegally squared off the arches in the basement, and so it had no integrity in the interior. And the center of the uh, building collapsed. But the in oh. exterior walls could have been uh, done like they did with the uh, old county bank building, used it as a facade for a new structure inside. And then I was involved uh, for several years with a building on Lower Pacific that fronted also on Front Street and the built the basement would flood and we had, uh, it was Haber's Furniture and yes. uh -huh. the the basement flooded mm -hmm. oftentimes to yes. the point where we brought in truckloads of sand and just filled it up. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, <laughs> on the on the most recent development that I read about, if it's it said, uh, oh, um, I think it's a private development of well-to-do condominiums. Mm -hmm. uh, is that on that Haber's Furniture store or on the Walgreens? Yes, it is. Yes, yes it is. And that, that's one of the, uh, now the Historic Preservation Commission reviewed the project, but they could only review um, the historic aspect of it. They couldn't review the actual project itself. That's coming up later, I think, before the planning department and then the city council. But the issue is... Uh, can we build on uh, on floodplain 
uh, and dig basements below the level of the river and not expect uh, flooding issues. Uh, I'm, I'm a little dubious about it myself. Um, one developer on Ocean Street said that because there's such a high water table in this floodplain that um, he would have to uh, have pumps running around the clock to yeah. keep a, an underground basement, uh, uh, an underground parking area from flooding. And we have frequent blackouts, so I don't see how uh, this round the clock uh, mm. <laughs> pumping is going to work. Mm. It's like building something inside the ocean and hoping the ocean doesn't get inside. Right. Thank you. Mm. Well, I'm, well, I'm interested in your publication on Carmelita Cottages on Main oh, Street. Huh? Uh, I've, I've seen the uh, cover of that publication, but I haven't seen the entire publication. Is that available online? Um, I don't know. What, uh, it's a publication on Carmelita Cottages? Right. It's subtitled um, A Photographic Survey. And dated 1992. I don't remember. I, I didn't put it online. You think it's available in print form in some place? Uh, if you're talking about Rick Hyman's uh, uh, book, that would be in Every Structure Tells a Story. And that's the one that uh, did the, uh, the full history of Carmelita Cottages. I've seen that. Yeah. But this uh, photographic survey says documenting the conditions of the Carmelita cottages prior to restoration. Oh. No, I, I'm not sure where that's available. Oh, too bad. We're working on restoring the gardens at this point. Oh, great. And uh, I think this, this publication is more about the buildings, but it might show the gardens at an early stage. Gosh, uh, I'd have to look into my files to see if I can find uh, something related to it. That'd be great. Russ, one more 30 question. years, but I can find it. Yes. Have you heard anything about what the plans are for the present? downtown library branch mm. because it seems that the city council is determined to put a library in on the bottom floor of a six or seven story building where yes, uh, they have committed to that uh-huh yeah they've committed to that um, project and uh, there is no word as to what's going to happen to the old library um, oh. I think they're just looking for a tenant because it's not a bad building. Uh, like I kept saying, uh, it's it doesn't need uh, hardly any uh, uh, hardly anything because it's structurally sound, yeah. and it has some right. good facilities in it as well. I would personally like to see it used as uh, if they're not going to have the uh, library uh, in that place. I would. I would like to see a research library, the, uh, the section that uh, they've been on and off saying that they will support or they want to get it out of the library, the, uh, the genealogy collection and the uh, research half and the Californiana. And uh, one of the problems is uh, we're afraid we're going to be losing um, the Sentinel um, bound editions. Uh, that are being stored in the, the library. And so we need all that storage uh, for rare books and so forth. Yeah, well, that'll never happen. It'll be affordable housing. And they even had the nerve to mention in the Sentinel a few weeks ago that it could be a, com a common grounds or a community affair which we mm -hmm. already have down on lot four with all <laughs> those beautiful magnolia trees. And that's where exactly. they want to build the 
Yeah, Ross, I have, <laughs> I, I have a related question, Ross. Um, uh huh. And that is, why do you think Santa Cruz, I mean, many towns in California historically have had a town square or a public commons yes. or, uh, you know, you think of Paso Robles and uh, Healdsburg and so forth. Uh, why do you think Santa Cruz never had anything like that and how can we get it? Well, actually, it had two town squares. The first one is Mission Plaza. And the second one is uh, the lower plaza, as it's been called, or sometimes Pioneer Plaza. And that's in the uh, area around the clock tower uh, down to the Flatiron Building. But, um, yeah, I know what you mean. It, it doesn't have anything uh, of a large scale. But uh, we explored that during the 1989 uh, earthquake aftermath when we were trying to look for areas that might be available for uh, a, a town square type thing. One uh, suggestion was maybe uh, put it across the street from the Cooper House, which at the time was still standing, uh, in the area that became the Cinema 9. And then that would be the, uh, the town square around which other buildings could, uh, could cluster, which seemed to be the center of things. But uh, the problem is the real estate is uh, too valuable um, for that. So I suggested maybe uh, doubling up so that the down, the uh, the first floor would be business and the second floor would be plaza. That would be weird. Hey, Ross, although it was uh, suggested by your title about downtown, uh, you mentioned nothing about UCSC. Do you have any comments about that historically? Because that sure changed the culture of this community. That did, but I was trying to do an overview. Uh, yeah, that's a that's really a story in itself. The fact yes. that it uh, it came in at the time of the counterculture. Yes. And, uh, really was not what the town was expecting, but uh, it uh, it turned out just, uh, you know, it turned out better than they expected. Yes. And also, a last question, do you have any reflections in your research about uh, our community and the Spanish flu episode? Uh, Historically. Yes. Well, I wrote an article about it, as you may have read, uh, and uh, I showed the parallels between the uh, yes. Spanish influenza and uh, COVID-19 of today. There were similar instances, and they never knew, you know, how long this was going to last. And at one point, they even did a bonfire of their, uh, their masks. They thought it was over with. And then it came raging back. So we had three, uh, three surges of the disease at that time. And we've really got to uh, be vigilant and, and be prepared for the long haul uh, if we're going to do anything similar to it. But the masks they used were gauze cheesecloth. Yes. And doubled over several times. Yes, indeed. Thank you. That 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 is a very very important history. Was thank you. Yes, I I really really applaud that uh, the article and your observations, and for us to reflect upon, we've we've been here before. Yes, and I guess I we're. Get a link to that. Pardon? We could share. I wonder if we could get a link to that article that we could share on our website, if you don't mind. Please do. Yes, it's available. Okay. What, uh, was it published in the Sentinel? Yes. What day? What What day was um, it? I can't remember if it was March or April. Oh, way back. Oh, okay. 
We'll Google it. Yeah, Google. There was actually a series of them. That's why I started my uh, oh. um, my articles in the Sentinel. I was looking for a place that I could do more than one uh, uh, comment on the various historical parallels to what we're going through today. So okay. I wanted to cover both the pandemic as well as uh, what the aftermath, the economic aftermath of the pandemic was like. So that was article number two. Mm. And uh, then transitioned through the uh, uh, the Roaring Twenties and into the Great Depression and uh, how those uh, also had some parallels. They were all great articles. I'd like, especially like when you connected to your, your family, your own history and gave <laughs> personal touch and with some surprises. So they were great. You know, I came to Santa Cruz in 1970 and I was UCSE student way back. And wonderful. You've, you've opened up my eyes to things I didn't know about. I came in 1970 and I didn't know that the Garden Mall was built just two years before that. I had no idea. I also didn't know that the potatoes were grown. It was a big cash crop. I didn't know that way back. Isn't that something? And the thing I missed the most about when I first came here, I really liked the McEwen Bianchi building. I used to go there, being a Greek, they would have feta cheese in the barrel the, of brine solution. And that's yes. a vivid memory for me. So I was really sorry to see that building uh, disappear. Absolutely. I remember that um, they had fresh produce just outside the windows all along the, the front of the building. Yeah. And there were unique uh, kitchen items and gadgets that you could find inside as well as um, rare gourmet items and so it was it was quite popular with uh, tourists as well as a place where if you couldn't find it any place else you could find it at McHugh and Bianchi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ross, I remember growing up here um, all the churches were downtown uh -huh. and we had several grocery stores downtown. Lots of them, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I can't think of their names now, but. Uh, well, there was Pure Foods, which was in the. Uh, Pure Foods, yeah. It later became uh, Bookshop Santa Cruz. Mm. And uh, let's see, there was. Um, but there were several that were just family owned, not not the big yeah. names. Like yeah, there Pure were Foods. lots of them like that, but there was also a big one. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was in a Quonset hut, a, a large Quonset hut. And uh, yeah, people did uh, all of their major shopping downtown uh, uh, for their, their staples. And it was a big mistake, I think, when they tried to redirect traffic out of downtown in order to save the downtown, but they ended up making it a secondary uh, stop and uh, the downtown lost a lot of its main uh, businesses and became kind of um, a shopping center for non-essentials. And that was a mistake, I think. It, it lost a lot of its dynamic. Of course, we transitioned into the Garden Mall era and recovered from yeah. it as more of a tourist de destination. And that was uh, that was a good thing. And I, I sure miss the Cooper House and all of the... Uh, oh, yeah. uh, things that uh, that combined with that and the Pacific Apothecary across the street yes. where I used to get um, historic uh, apple crate uh, labels from Santa Cruz. Oh yes. <laughs> and another thing I think we missed the mark on was Route 4. You showed all those different freeway, uh, <laughs> the wish list. Mm -hmm. But the Route 4 would have taken traffic from San Francisco up across to the university and then come down through the Harvey West and onto the present day freeway to San Jose or Watsonville. We yeah. really missed the mark there, but it <laughs> would have gone through um, Norm Lesson's backyard. And <laughs> <laughs> he, he was pretty much the highlight of Santa Cruz then, and that just wasn't going to happen. Uh -huh. Yeah, there was very expensive real estate up there on the hill, and and the yeah. powers to be were not going to let that turn into a freeway. Well, the county was always looking for 
land it didn't have to pay for, and you can't believe the number of plans that they made for De La Viega Park. They mm -hmm. wanted to turn it into the uh, county jail and uh, county courthouse so that instead of uh, being on the, the San Lorenzo River, they would have put that monstrosity in the park. Mm -hmm. And then in order to make it more accessible to automobiles, one of the freeways would have uh, gone through the park. Yeah. So that would have really destroyed a lot of the character of what uh, De La Viega Park means to a lot of us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ross? Thank you, Ross. Uh-huh. This is Tom. So, uh, uh -huh. me from town that's uh, process or that they're working on and I know the outfit involved with and just wanted on your thoughts it sounds like it's a, a beautiful way to retain some history and or at least recognize history do you know anything about that I didn't catch that what was the archway um, for Chinatown that they that the Al family has been oh part of yes uh-huh yeah, I think that's a wonderful way to represent uh, history that's uh, that's no longer visible, uh, it, because it's an art piece, right, but it's right. also Still to something it. that will, huh? Yeah, it gives a uh, a way to remember that. Right, and to remember to remember it in a positive and respectful way. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sure. All right. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, well, I'm just blown away, Roz. That was, I had no idea. I thought I knew a little bit about Santa Cruz history, but that's just, um, it really astounding. Yeah. So I would, yeah. I would deem you a historic treasure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yep. Um, three, three cheers. Yes. Yeah. I have one sure. last question, if I could ask. Um, I, just, I just wondered a little more about what is underground now on Pacific Avenue. Are, is there anything that's being used underground? I wondered about that, too. Yes, there is. Uh, since the uh, 1989 earthquake, I, I've seen the the town exposed pretty much, and there is underground parking under the St. George Hotel, oh. and uh, mm. uh, underground uh, facilities under the, uh, what's it called, the Rittenhouse uh, building. Um, so he here and there along the avenue, there's uh, underground uses, and I think they're, they're relying on the levee to, uh, uh, to keep it that way. Positions. Are they still connected like they used to be? No. Any of those? Uh, um, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, they. we got to see kind of where they were after the buildings were removed, but then they dug them out and created new foundations for uh, modern buildings, especially since the soil is subject to liquefaction. They wanted to make sure that they were up to uh, uh, modern standards. So the uh, linked okay. basements are no longer there, although they do still have to deliver uh, in at certain times a day in the morning to try to uh, avoid avoid the uh, the a lot of people in the area. Hello? I mean, uh, you know, the, the shoppers in the area because they they don't have back doors still. Oh, so they deliver to the basement. Underground? Uh, they deliver to, uh, what do you call it, um, a, an elevator in the sidewalk, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Russ. I really appreciate this. This was uh, thank you, an thank excellent you. program. Thank you, well, Russ. Thanks, everybody. That's great. Appreciate yeah. being asked.